about Nazi Germany that would not be a representation of fascism, which also turns around to be the fascism of representation. Well, I think what, what Louis C.K. is doing here is kind of suggesting that, let's say, if you had these 50 girls doing this goodbye Jews thing as part of the film, yeah, then something in this magical, smooth operation of representation gets undone and exposed and somehow things stop sticking together so neatly. Yeah? Now, so, this is the first time I'm showing this uh, Louis C.K. Uh, in the context of this, uh, of Triumph um, of the Wheels. So I don't know how well it's coming across, and then whether you hear what I heard, I, I heard when I first heard this sketch. But I thought, is it interesting that he talks about the technology of making a Hollywood movie? And the technology of making a Hollywood movie really involves 50 takes, 50 pretty girls doing this one line until you get it just so. Yeah? And yet, all of that has to be completely taken away from the finished result for it to work as a representation. Yeah? But that's why this representation itself is already contaminated. Yeah? It is already contaminated with the same power relations. Does it make sense? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So <coughs> let's have a look at uh, let's skip something. Like that. Uh, Um, let's, let's just do the next paragraph. So we established 20 years after the Second World War, after Trump of the Wheel and all that. If you wanted to be an artist, you had to have these three pillars. You need to have to know your Marx, know your Freud, and know your semiotics, or your theory of science. Who, by the way, is the author of the theory of science? It's Strauss, I suppose. Yes, yes. Um, the Saussure? Saussure? Yeah, that's what he meant, I believe. Yeah? He's the linguist. The linguist, yeah. that's right, yeah. Um, so semiotics, also sometimes known as structuralism, um, is, is a way to understand social uh, reality as symbolic. Yeah? Now, we, we don't really do semiotics here uh, because I think it was done to death. And you know everyone is a kind of unwilling uh, participant in, in, in this project. But in semiotics, um, it's a study of the way signs operate. And signs, in the semiotic understandings, operate in one of three ways. Signs can be either iconic, or indexical, or what else? I just remember the signifier and sign. Signifier and signifier. Maybe image. Yes. Yes. So, what kind of signs we have? We have. What What does it mean to have an iconic sign? Oh, I don't know. No. So, mm. so Standing for the epitome. So, for instance, you know, you look at the sign here above the door. Yeah. So it has uh, the person running. Yeah. That's a kind of. That's a sign that resembles the action. But then you have a more abstract sign, the arrow. That just, you know, we just kind of accept that the arrow indicates a certain direction. Um, photography studies have been based on semiotics for, for, for a very long time. And I think uh, in, in, in many uh, parts of uh, the, the academia, um, 
that's still almost the only way to think about photography. For instance, in, in Westminster, where Victor Bergen set up the photography department um, in the 80s, um, and when it was called the uh, Central London Polytechnic. Semiotics was the way you understood photographs as surfaces which are symbolic of something which is happening over there. Yeah. So um, I kind of hope that we don't talk about it too much. You, will, you kind of can skip over. But if you want to talk about semiotics in, in, in greater uh, depth, that, uh, then, then we, could, we, we could do that. Let's, let's move to the next part of it and see, um, let's see how we get to that, how we get on to that. So th then came the five brief years. Who can read it though? Yes. Then came the five brief and passing jubilant and enigmatic years. At the gates of our world, there was Vietnam, of course, and the first major blow to the powers and people. But here, inside our walls, what exactly was taking place? An amalgam of revolutionary and anti repressive politics, a war fought on two fronts against social exploitation and psychic repression, a surge of libido modulated by the cluster, perhaps. At any rate, it is this familiar dualistic interpretation that has laid claim to the events of those years. The dream that cast itself between the First World War and fascism. Over the previous parts of Europe, the journey of will and right, and the France of the surrealists, had returned and set fire to reality itself, Marx and Freud in the same and mm -hmm. And uh, maybe um, just skip to the to this. Anti-Arabic shows first of all how much ground has been covered, but it does much more than that. It wastes no time in describing the old idols. Even though it does not, it does have a great deal of fun and fraud. Most important, it motivates us to go further. Okay, so I guess what this text is trying to say at this stage is that this way of grasping the world in terms of semiotics, Marxism, and Freudianism came to an end with the student revolts. Something else is coming instead. And anti Oedipus, this book, which we're not going to read today, offers an alternative. Yeah? An alternative, why? Because this Freudian Marxist semiotic structuralist approach is a bit like trying to fight Nazism with Schindler's list, or trying to fight triumph of the will with Schindler's list. It's still using the same language. Because, I mean, we didn't watch a bit of Schindler's list. Perhaps we, we had to, but, um, you know, time is short. Um, but who said that the list reminded you of the triumph? Someone said that. Oh, uh, said that, yeah. Triumph, yeah. 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 triumph of the will develops a language of cinema that can later be used to make films against North Nazi North Germany. It can be used to make any kind of film, but it's still using the same language. Yeah? And that is the problem. Unless you go to the core of how this language is put together, you are ending up repeating the same power relations. This, you, 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 all, you all the time regurgitating the same story, even though the story is different. The way of telling it is the same. So how can I make you really feel what we are talking about here? Because I think this is crucial to what is the makeup of contemporary art, or what is the makeup of political art. And you know, it also kind of answers the question, or at least it, it doesn't ignore the question of what an artist can do today, specifically today, you know, in, 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 on this day. Um, if your image, how can you make sure that your work is not feeding back into the same mechanisms you are trying to fight against or you are concerned about? Um, because you know how um, 
in photography, you will often see, and I, I used to teach in an undergraduate course, and my, the bane of my existence was students making pictures of homeless people. And it was banned on the course. They knew they're not allowed. And yet, they, you know, without fail, will take photographs of people uh, who are sleeping on the streets. Uh, and it was very hard to explain to them, to the students, what is wrong with it. Or why it might be wrong. Because the students felt, and you know, I'm, I'm not really picking on this student, but it's a general kind of understanding. Many photographers feel that photographing someone's misery or someone's suffering is a good thing. It will make the world a better place. Yeah? If you show how someone suffers, whether in a war, whether in a, uh, or the council estate, whether in a food bank, uh, it's a good thing to do. It's a kind of progressive. Yeah? It's maybe even a sort of uh, political. But here's the rub. As long as your way of doing it makes the operation of representation invisible, as long as you rely in doing that on the mechanics of representation, you're not really getting out yet of the same way of thinking that puts the homeless person in the in the in the in front of a shop door or something like that. Yeah. You are within the same framework because it is the same representational mechanism that operates economically, politically, aesthetically, visually. And it's the mechanism that needs to be somehow made visible, made tangible. We need to be able to smell how it works. What drives right the wheel does, it makes this incredibly seductive picture of power by juxtaposing the one and the many, by saying, look, there's no need to worry. You can laugh and dance and play and smile because he is looking after you. He's coming from the sky on a plane through the clouds, yeah, um, and he is looking after you. You can do your own things, polish your buttons, cook, make soup, you know, eat sausages, and safe in the knowledge that you are taken care of, you are protected, you know, you are held. That is the presentation. Yeah, that's how it operates because the Führer is representative of the people. He is the people. It's the one and the many in which the one is the many. Yeah, that's how representation operates. That's why in Triumph of the Will, you all the time have this uh, dialectical montage of these uh, shots, you know, the... Because you are forced to somehow face these powers of representation, these powers of what makes something an image. Okay, um, so let's go to the next page. To the next page, and, and have a look here. So, could someone read to us from "It would be a mistake"? Yes, 
okay, yeah. It would be a mistake to read, read Angular because it's a new, as the new theoretical reference. You know, that, mu that much around the theory that finally encompasses everything. That finally totalizes and reassures the one we are told we need so badly in our age of dispersion and specialization, where hope is like. One must not look for philosophy amid the extraordinary profusion of new notions and surprise concepts. And the this is not a flashy idea. Let's stop here uh, because uh, let's move to the end. Start the next paragraph. Uh, when, it, when it says, when the three adversaries confronted by Antiochus, the three adversaries that, uh, that uh, Vishal will be reading about are what we mentioned earlier, Marxism, Freud, and Semiotics. So, uh, and what you need to understand, maybe that's less what, what I need to say. Why for Deleuze and Guattari, Marxism doesn't work any longer as a political force? Why Freud, despite all the deep insight is also a problem. And why semiotics is not the solution to understand social reality as symbolic? Because all three, Marx, Freud, semiotics, are also based on representation. Yeah? Are also based on the same rational worldview that has been discussed several times already is that's what we got out of the Enlightenment. In, in Marx, the proletariat and the capital and the capital are locked in a combat, in a struggle. Everywhere, always, that is the struggle. Wherever there is society, there will be the worker, there will be the employer, they will have conflict of interest, there will be struggle. It's like, it's universal. It's as universal as God, if you like. Yet in Freud, whatever it is, whoever you are, you want to kill your daddy and to have sex with your mother. And that is not, not, not negotiable. It's just the option. The Oedipus story is, is, is a dream that plays in every head, yes. Unless you're psychotic. Unless you're psychotic, yes. and then what happens? Then you, you can not attain the Oedipus state, then you are in a pre Oedipus state, and you don't have this kind of problematic problem. Well, according, according to Freud, you become psychotic if you do not manage to deal with these desires in an appropriately socialized way, or if you get punished excessively for, let's say, being really interested by your mother's vagina. Uh, if you get punished very harshly or something like that, then you will end up psychotic. Yeah. But for Freud, this is universal. It is for everyone. Yeah. And for the lesson what I read, they say, well, that's kind of oppressive, you know? Why, why is there this universality? But it's the same universality that operates in all modes of representation. <coughs> and what is semiotics? It's another way in which something is being represented as an image. So again, look at the sign above the door. The, how do, do the sign represents what we need to do in, in case of emergency? Yeah, you have to exit through that. So it's another represent or the same representational mechanism. So the lesson of Atari, that's what Freud, uh, that's what Foucault is telling us here. They are concerned with the way the artist or the intellectual or the poet build their resistance mechanisms on principles that are ultimately representation. Yeah? Now, where Foucault takes this idea that representation might be a problem, well, he gets it from Heidegger. He gets it from essays like the question concerning technology and the age of the world picture, which we uh, already read, uh, or at least part of it. Because it's Heidegger who says, by stepping into the age of enlightenment, by stepping into the age of reason, we learned to represent the world to ourselves as a picture. The world became a picture, and me, you, 
I became a subject. So it's Heidegger who exposed the operation of representation in its anesthetizing, deadening, detaching gesture of removing the world from you so that you can represent it back to yourself. Yeah? Heidegger, however, did not get to, did not discuss the ethics of it. But yeah, I want you to understand that well, there is a kind of genealogy of this concern with representation that in the hands of Deleuze and Guattari and, Fro and, and Foucault acquires an ethical dimension that is lacking in Heidegger. Um, and this ethical dimension says, let's be very careful around all systems of representation. And while art is not being mentioned here, you know, you could put a representational art, whether it is figurative or abstract, at the same, you could, you could extend the list and say, Marxism, Freud, um, semiotics, and, fi uh, and figuration in art. They all belong to the same order. And make no mistake, abstract art, like abstract ex expressionism, still operates on in the same model. It just rejects the accurate copy. It gives you the inaccurate copy. Maybe instead of representing the external world, it represents the internal world, like in Jackson Pollock. But it's still a representation. Yeah? OK. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, I actually do have a question. I was thinking about Jenny Holzer. You know, what she did, she would rather be sample for you know, truisms, as okay. she called yes. And But so by sort of exploiting the system of you know, theoretica, she is recontextualizing it and putting it in public space, yes. thereby utilizing the yes. public. So would that, would that satisfy the condition of a non-representative art because of the way she deconstructs the... the I, don't, I don't think there is a condition to satisfy it. No, no, no. no. I, I mean, would, would that put her outside of the systems of re representation and then therefore enable her to reveal the, the essence of her art? It's, you know, I don't think, it, I don't think it's a question that can be asked or that needs to be asked. Uh, it can, if you want. Yes. Um, well, look, you could look at any artwork through this perspective of how it stands in relation to representation. Yeah. Um, and you would get different insights and different responses. So it's not, and it's not, I don't want you to kind of to, to have a, a list of artists who are pro representation and the list of artists who are against, because the list itself is a representational mechanism. We need to have another way. It's very difficult what we are trying to do. You know, we are trying to really get under the skin of what makes something an image and how we can play with it, you know, or expose the way it is done. But so, so yes. Doesn't it essentially boil down to non-universalism? So you, you it's well, the, the you can, but, it, but then, what does it mean to say boil down? What does it mean to say essentially? So if you say it's, it is essentially non not essential. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it can be. You know, the thing is, you can make it work with whatever you want, with whatever you want to do. These are tools. Yeah. Now, if you are saying, is it rejecting grand narratives in the kind of notion of the how of how postmodernity rejects universal narratives? Yes, it does. Yes, that's, that, 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 that is correct. Because Marxism and Freud and semiotics, they were all attempted to give a complete universal, uh, all-encompassing picture of the world. And these new kids on the block, they come in and say, these universal strategies are not good enough. Not because they are wrong. Maybe they are too good. They just always give you an answer. They always get you an answer. And in the end, you forget to question the mechanics of the questioning itself. Let's take a few more lines from this text. Um, so the three adversaries. Once the three adversaries confronted by Antiochus, 
three adversaries who do not have the same strength, who represent varying degrees of danger, and whom the book combats in different ways. One, the political ascetics, the sad militants, the terrorists of theory, those who would preserve the pure order of politics and political discourse, bureaucrats of the revolution and civil servants of truth. Mm. The poor stop here, stop here. Whom do you think he has in mind? Who are the terrorists of theory? Who are the bureaucrats of the revolution and civil servants of truth? That's great. Right. Right. It's the, yeah, it's the, how would you say, well, establishment. No, 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 not the establishment. It's the anti-establishment. It's the people who go to demonstrations. It's the people who distribute leaflets. Is the people who uh, sit around the kitchen table talking about the revolution, and is the Marxists? Um, he, it's the Marxist. He says sad militants. That's very powerful. Political ascetics. And what 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 is asceticism in Christianity? Self denial. Yeah, denial of pleasure is. Uh, well, I think, forgive me um, if I'm, um, yeah, but I think Corbyn is a kind of a skeptic like this, you know, and the way we are kind of made to understand his lifestyle, you know, this sort of um, simplicity, you know, this life given over to the struggle, you know, and they say there's, there's a danger that if that's what you do, you become a bureaucrat. So you fight bureaucracy, but you yourself become a bureaucrat of truth, a kind of uh, technologist, technologist of, of politics. Yeah? Uh, the next one. Uh, could we, so yeah. you just move the thing on the screen? No. Okay, I will. <laughs> the next one. The poor technicians. The poor technicians of desire psychoanalysts and semiologists of every sign and symptom, who would subjugate the multiplicity of desire to the twofold law of structure and life. Who he has in mind here? The therapists, the psychoanalysts, the, um, the, um, the industry of uh, mental well-being, the poor technicians of desire, yeah? It's the people who will explain your feelings and your emotions by saying, yeah, but that's because of your mother. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, that is a childhood trauma. And what is the problem with that? The problem with that is that psychoanalysis and semiology, uh, that, that every sign and every symptom will be reduced to either to the twofold law of structure and luck. What is this luck? It's the castration. Yeah? Is that you know you desire something that you don't have. So the woman obviously desires to have the penis. Uh, you know, that's Lacan, Lacanian, Lacanian psychoanalysis. Um, the boy desires to be his father, he desires the mother that he cannot have because that it is a taboo. So your whole mechanics of desire are articulated through what you don't have, or the negative, as Matthew was saying earlier. You know, uh, that's where the negative is coming from. The negative, in this sense, is the Lacanian understanding of the psyche, as, or, or sense of self, as growing out of the negative, out of absence, out of not heavy. Yeah? So that is the uh, the poor technicians of desire. And the third one. Last but not least, the major enemy, the strategic adversary is fascism. Whereas anti oedipus opposition to the others is more of a tactical engagement. And not only a historical fascism, the fascism of Hitler and Mussolini, which was able to mobilize and use the desire for masses so effectively but also the fascism in us all, in our heads and in our everyday behavior. The fascism that causes us to love power, 
the desire 